Welcome to Light and Shadow. I'm your host, Maya Washington. It's time to bring some inspirational sports stories out of the shadows and into the light. Welcome, welcome. Today's guest is Jared Klein. Jared is a 47-year-old married father of four, and he's also a retired veteran, E-7, of 23 years, serving with the United States Air Force as a security forces manager. He's been deployed 10 times with three deployments in support of Operation Allied Force in Kosovo, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation Enduring Freedom. Jared currently lives in Tampa and is a grad student at the University of South Florida, Go Bulls. He's enrolled in the Master of Social Work program. He hopes to help veterans who suffer from trauma. And this is part of the reason I've wanted us to get to hear from Jared today. Uh, Some fun facts, Jared is a native of Detroit. His favorite professional teams are the Lions, Tigers, Pistons, and Red Wings. And his favorite college football team is the U of M Wolverines. We're not going to be talking about that today. He has played soccer, football, basketball, tennis, and enjoys swimming. He is also trained in Taekwondo, kickboxing, boxing, and jiu-jitsu. Jared has also coached Little League and soccer. His beliefs around health and fitness are to not only maintain physical health, but he also believes that uh, not taking care of those things can be detrimental to our mental health as well. So welcome, Jared. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. So Jared, at a time like this, it is so kind of you to take out time to talk to me and to share with our audience um, some practical advice for those who might be in some of the major cities um, where we are seeing unrest and and situations uh, that are definitely hitting home for many people. And and there's a lot on our minds about how to protect ourselves, our our families, um, our property, and obviously our lives um, during times like this. Before we dive in, I'd love to know um, if you have a quote or a mantra or anything that keeps you inspired day to day and and has inspired you throughout your pretty amazing career. Uh, Yeah, sure. Uh, And again, first off, uh, I would, again, just like to reiterate, thank you so much for um, including me into this process. Um, I think it's it's very valid and important that. you know, we all work together, and it's amazing what you can actually do from your home, eighteen hundred miles away, uh, from from any situation. Um, but going to the motto, um, there was a deceased Marine named Travis Minion. Um, he died in the Afghanistan War, and one of his mottos that he carried around is actually an old uh, uh, philosophical motto, and it's "If not me, then who?" and um, the basis behind that, and, and it, there's actually the Travis Minion uh, project, the basis behind that is uplifting your community. And to simplify what that means is that if you've ever been in a public restroom um, and you see the garbage can by the door, and sometimes you notice that people miss the garbage can and the paper towel may hit the floor, and you look at that, um, you have a conscious decision to make at that point. And that is whether you pick that paper towel up and you throw it away, the if not me, then who would automatically drive you to pick up that paper towel? Certainly people of the establishment can pick it up and throw it away. But are you are you sure you're guaranteed? And on a larger scale, you know, um, if we think of it this way, um, you know, how how am I expected to clean up my community, let alone the rest of the world, if I can't even pick up a paper towel next to a trash can in a bathroom that I've, I just passed by consciously. So, um, you know, there's times I even forget, you know, but um, I tell you a lot of times when I'm in the public bathrooms now, uh, I'm very aware that, uh, that that paper towel is there and, and I, I pick it up and I throw it away. Um, and so kind of applying that, if not me, then who, um, you know, when I'm in my neighborhood and I see things that, that might be just a little bit off, I try to approach them and address them, uh, obviously in a safe manner. But, um, you know, for the most part, I can't just let things pass um, thinking that somebody else will just take care of it 
besides me, if that makes sense. It, it makes a lot of sense and um, is the reason I'm so grateful to uh, be able to talk to you because I think you're the exact right person. Uh, and this is the spirit that we all need to find within ourselves right now uh, during sure. a pandemic situation and during uh, some very serious unrest that is happening. Um, while it originated out of um, a, a place of peace and, and the best intentions of, uh, at least here in uh, the Twin Cities, I can only speak for um, what's here happening where I am. And a lot of what's right. happened has been in solidarity um, nationally um, because we, right. we, we saw an injustice in our community and our local officials and government um, have uh, expressed concern and have uh, have uh, taken action to give the public uh, some sense that uh, a lot of our grief and our mourning and our concerns uh, have been sure. heard. And unfortunately, yeah. in the midst and process of of, of that, uh, we are in a situation where people from outside of our state uh, have unfortunately taken advantage of of some of that. Uh, true deep grief and the amazing movement that a lot of people were were accomplishing in terms of relationships and uh, working to affect long term <laughs> systemic yeah, change certain, after this certain, incident. Certain. And so, yeah. right now, what Minnesotans really need, and and what we're seeing is is people all over the country are are, are needing. Uh, is just practical advice, uh, things that we can do sure. from our homes um, on these long, hot summer nights. And um, right. what is the National Guard facing out there? Um, what are police forces sort of prepared and trained to do? And why is it important that uh, civilians, just regular people, uh, stay inside um, during a situation like this. Well, certainly, and and um, you know, I so as a as a veteran of three combat tours, um, let me tell you, I I can't imagine what the people of the Twin Cities are going through right now, and, and that says a lot, right? Because um, domestically, we we never prepare for this thing. See, in the military, when I when I suited up and it was time to go to combat, I had trained you know, for months, if not years prior to going to that, um, you know, can you imagine an eight year old child right now in a neighborhood who, who one, I mean, it's, it's not even conceptual to think that that child would have training and understand what's going on, let alone have to face some of the atrocities. And, um, I know a lot of people are politicizing this. I just want to make a point very clear. And that is, you know, protesting is made the idea of protesting is to build a community up, right? Rioting and looting are made to destroy your community. And I think that's very important to understand that. And if you, if you want to talk about the National Guard and the police force right now, uh, typically I think you got to be between the ages of 21 and 23 to be a police officer. In the National Guard, you, you only have to be 17 to sign up if, with your parents' permission. So what the National Guards are, Guard is facing is that you have from 17, say, to 25-year-olds. And they're, right now they're facing what we call a, a intersectionality, right? One, they want to be 17 years old. They want to be at home eating Doritos and playing Fortnite. But <laughs> two, they, al they also want to be a soldier, right? They, they signed up. They wanted to serve their country. And even though we, we, when we raise our hand for the oath to protect this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, we really, really never hope that it's domestic. So right now you have a National Guardsman out there that's scared. He's absolutely terrified that he may have to use deadly force against one of his fellow citizens. So, I, so while we politicize everything, I want you to think for a moment. I want everybody who's listening to think for a moment what that must feel like to be 20 years old and carrying out a semi-automatic rifle with the ability to take somebody's life. That's got to be terrifying for them, you know, especially more so here than even in a combat environment, because as much as you train, especially in my experience, there's no way you could ever train for that. So mm -hmm. I applaud everybody who raises their right hand to protect. And I'm talking firefighters. I'm talking, you know, EMT, nurses, frontline people 
that that are really offering their lives to save other people's lives. Mm-hmm. So what they're what they're ex- what they're experiencing right now, especially the police. So for the, again, and I can't get into the politics of police because right now um, that's a very hard discussion. Right. Exactly. That, that a, it's very nuanced yeah. here in Minneapolis at the moment. Well, yeah. well, and I can't imagine there's anything I can say about police officers, good or bad, that that people would ever could even agree with, you know, at this point, because everybody's formulated mm-hmm. their opinions right now, mm-hmm. either mm-hmm. for or against. So me me contributing to that conversation, um, that would be a completely different, you know, uh, podcast or discussion. So um but what they are facing is they're facing a bunch of angry people. And, that, yes. and that's whether they are passively protesting or they are violently uh, rioting, um, they're facing an angry people. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and, and the police are scared. You know, as, as much as they want to protect and serve, they, you know, the, the, there can't be this idea that that a human being wakes up in the morning and says, I hope I get to kill somebody today. I can't I can't imagine us as American citizens um, having that belief system. But some people get paid to have to use excessive force, whether it be in austere conditions or here in a in a domesticated environment. So mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I would I know it's hard to ask for it, but I think we need some compassion for those that don't want to be in this situation, whether they be police or they be citizens. You know, we need we need a, a, a huge understanding right now. And so what they're facing right now um, on a violent aspect is an angry people. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, through studies, we as humans are are innately we have an, an innate pension for violence. Um, and what I mean by that is if you take two, three year old children, you put them in a room and put one toy. <laughs> one of those kids is getting a toy. Right. One of the kids mm-hmm. is getting a toy. And it isn't going to be because of hugging rainbows and kissing unicorns. It's very rarely is it sharing. Um, it's the social institutions that teach these pe- these these children uh, their morals, right, right and wrong. Mm-hmm. And right now you have an angry mob that that the deviance that lies, right. So everybody's talking about the target situation, right. What kind of mm-hmm. police officer wants to run into that mob? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, when three hundred people are facing a police force of fifty people. 50, I don't care how many guns they have. They're not going to run in against 50 people, mm-hmm. right? That's like, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't advise my people to do it. I would, I would pull back and I would regroup. And in, a, in an attempt to not politicize, um, because yeah. there are you know, so hard, nuances, though, you know, nuances <laughs> here in the Twin Cities, um, mm-hmm. for sure, that make this kind of a very unique um, situation because of what our um, – those forces who are here to protect us are finding yeah. very calculated um, urban warfare style uh, tactics um, that outsiders yeah, and absolutely. possibly people um, inspired to join them <laughs> um, in that yeah. behavior have sort of yeah. created an environment where uh, for the most part um the uh, people at the heart of and the organizing uh, communities uh, who are most impacted by uh, last week's events have said, go home tonight, um, support uh, our uh, state and local government in restoring order, restoring peace so that we can get back to work. And uh, we've got people in their homes tonight in um, Minneapolis. And by the time that, um, we get this on air, uh, we will kind of know how, how that, um, how the night panned out. (laughs) The night is, the night is young. And so, um, people are just wondering, you know, what, what should you do if you're inside your home and you hear, um, what sounds like gunshots, um, whether they're rubber bullets or not, you know, if you hear or see a, a fire burning, on your block. <laughs> Meat and potatoes, all right? So the tactical, some of the tactical things um, that some of the uh, civilians can do. So, um, you, you know, first and foremost, safety is paramount, all right? Your safety, their safety, everybody's safety in the city is paramount. And understand that a house is a thing that can be insured, you know, and even if it's not insured, it's just stuff. Ideally, you'll live, uh, what we say in the military is you'll live to fight another day. Um, get in your car and leave. Right. If you have that capability. So if there's any doubt, like some people say, I have to defend my house. You you really don't. It's just stuff. 
But if you absolutely 100 percent, let's say you're debilitated and you can't go, uh, you don't have a vehicle, uh, maybe you have a, a sick relative in the house, it's not easy to get out. Some of the things that you can do. So first off, you got to look at, at what is the threat. You assess the threat. So ideally, we're looking at possibly like bricks flying, um, you know, tear gas from police, uh, unfortunately, possible bullets, um, rubber bullets, things like that. Um, and in the military, of course, we have gear to protect against that, but you in your house, you'd be surprised what you're, you're capable of doing for yourself. So, um, we can piece by piece of this, right? So a brick, um, so two things to protect against a brick is somehow boarding up your windows, right? Obviously, ideally putting up plywood would be, um, one of the more optimal, um, uh, measures, However, not everybody has plywood lying around. So things like uh, if you have paintings or pictures on your wall, you can kind of use those things um, to kind of stack up. Stacking uh, is a way to do it. Um, and then uh, pots and pans. Now, this may seem silly, but it's not silly when, when bricks are coming through windows and glass and shrapnel is flying everywhere. But putting pots and pans on your head um, make make good deflectors. If you have novelty football helmets or baseball helmets, something hard that you can place on your head to deflect any of that uh, debris, right? Uh, protecting your your central organs, uh, which help keep you alive. Uh, things like stacked newspapers, um, tying them to your body, um, extra thick pillows are right, protecting. If you don't have anything, shrapnel can penetrate your skin um, and possibly cause some severe damage. Things that you have in your household, such as couch cushions and pillows. Uh, couch cushions are probably more optimal than, say, a bed pillow. But if you're thinking, what you got to think of is hard objects that you can apply to your body to prevent these things from from penetrating. You know, mm -hmm. uh, cookie sheets, mm -hmm. things like that. You know, something that that would deflect. Right, something that would deflect something sharp from flying in, and that's that's if bricks are coming in and, and things like that. You know, um, so those are some of the things that you can do. You know, but then you get like um, so other other things that that you can do too. So if it escalates, you know, um, like uh, what I would uh, what I highly recommend is having readily available some like wet sheets or wet towels. Mm -hmm. and in fact, if you could just keep your bathtub filled with water and just have a supply of sheets and towels available, um, mm -hmm. that helps out. Um, I know some firefighters had had stated this before. Um, is that dousing, or if you have a garden hose outside, you can douse your house with water um, mm -hmm. every so often or every few hours. That may help prevent fires from starting on your house. Um, you know, but if you don't have time, time is, is uh, not of the essence. Again, constantly have an escape route. All right. So you have to have a way out, um, you know, especially if you're barricading. You know, if there's, there's I, if the idea of barricading from external forces trying to gain access into your house, whether it be people or any kind of projectile, if you're boarding mm -hmm. doors and boarding windows, you should always have an escape plan, right? Um, mm. You know, well, just That's like so important in, because someone yeah. could could create a little fortress and then have uh, be stuck, boarded themselves in and get stuck. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So just like when you were in grade school and you did your fire drill plans, um, you know, it's similar to that. So, um, and you know what, you can barricade your front and back door if you need to, but understand how are you going to get out? So plan, just have a plan of execution and make everybody mm -hmm. in the family aware of it. And everybody, mm -hmm. in fact, you should probably rehearse it um, once or twice. Uh, so that way those motor skills during the midst, see the, the problem is when conflict happens, when you have a, an adverse situation, we rely heavily on motor skills. And if you don't practice mm -hmm. those motor skills, then you end up tripping, you end up not knowing what to do, and, and confusion settles in, uh, your adrenaline rushes, your blood thins, and you have, you know, people pass out and things like that. So um, a simple plan of action and rehearsing that plan can be the matter of life and death. So a friend of mine had mentioned um, uh, aluminum cans, such as beer cans or, or uh, soda cans, pop cans, um, tied together, whether it be dental floss or rope or something like that. Uh, they make a good alarm detection system. So placing them around your house and things like that, um, you know, in areas or avenues of approaches, um, mm -hmm. you know, they can they can alert you in time, you know, to hey, if it's in the front yard, you go out the back door. If it's in the backyard, you go out the front door. Uh, but the key is not to not to stand and fight if you're ready to to, you know, if, if you don't have the means to stand and fight. Um, 
you know, others, if it gets, if it gets worse or, or you know, kind of bad, um, you know, bathtubs, uh, just like a, if you were to try to survive a tornado or, or any natural disaster, everybody tells you to go into like a central point, you know, of your house or, you know, possibly bathtubs and things like that. Bathtubs uh, provide really, really good shelter for a lot of things just because of the material they're made out of. Um, mm-hmm. So staying in bathtub, staying low. Um, unfortunately, you can't really fit five people in a bathtub. Um, so again, looking around your house, fortifying certain areas, um, thickening, you know, certain, you know, what we call safety rooms, uh, things like that. You know, um, the, again, the reality is, is that um, very hard things in your house are very protective to things that want to penetrate your house. So uh, tables, you know, doors, things like that, you know, um, those are the things kind of repurposing them. You know, a closet door can be repurposed to put over a bathtub um, to prevent from, you know, uh, uh, projectiles flying in the house. You know, it's just another protective measure that you can use, you know, things like that. So. So what about tear gas or smoke? Um, if sort of whatever is going on outside your door, you, you've done all of these best practices that you suggested sure. you, you got you got your beer cans outside, but all of a sudden <laughs> um, tear gas is somehow getting in, inside or getting through um, a crack you you thought you had sealed but hadn't, or um, right, right. you're having Again, some kind of involuntary experience. You've, you've done things, yeah. but what can you do if, if, if this literally kind of comes into your home in the form of um, sure. uh, tear gas? So what I mentioned before is having the towels and the and the blankets readily available. Um, that that's another reason. So so it's a, it's a good protection against um, tear gas and it's a good protection uh, against fire, right? Um, so if you have a if you have these damp towels and these damp sheets, uh, obviously if it's a fire, just like what we've learned in school, you stay low, uh, stop, drop, and roll kind of thing. You want to stay low. You want to stay under the the smoke because it's not so much the the flames that get you as it is, is the smoke inhalation. So you Mm -hmm. can use wet towels as a, as a filter right now, everybody's wearing masks. Um, Masks are another good protection against smoke inhalation masks. um, Although they don't prevent it, they're also, um, they are helpful against uh, tear gas. Um, You and I offline, I talked a little bit about tear gas and what I was trying to emphasize is that um, most tear gas is what they call oscillium capsum OC. And what it is, is the root. It's the seed of a, a, a hot pepper. It's, it's some, you know, it has, a, a, it has a potency uh, to it. So it's not like your typical uh, store-bought pepper spray, you know, where they prevent you from, you know, help you walk out to your car kind of thing. It's like that, but on steroids, right? So it's really, really mm-hmm. heavy stuff. And what it does is it makes your skin feel like it's burning. It causes inhalation problems. You have trouble breathing uh, and things like that. So if you have a wet rag to be able to cover your face, um, and if you if you happen to get any of the gas on your skin, you're going to know it. Um, it's going to hurt. You got to ride most of that out, unfortunately. But if it gets in your eyes or inhalation, immediately douse yourself with water. You want to rinse your eyes out at least 20 minutes with, I'm sorry, 20 seconds with water, you know, um, and, and, uh, at milk, believe it or not, um, you know, how we see these challenges where people are eating peppers and they drink milk right away. Uh, the coating properties of milk for your, your esophagus and your stomach lining, um, you know, it, it works the same on your skin. So if you were to douse yourself, if you've got a gallon of milk and somebody's like, I'm burning them up fire, pour a gallon of milk on top of them immediately, right? Um, that'll ease the, the uh, sensation, the burning sensation. Um, but water itself is, is, um, a very good, um, tool to have, uh, available to stop from uh, both fire and, um, you know, the, the chemical irritant of tear gas. And I've heard, um, that wearing glasses is better than wearing contacts or, um, do you have any insights on, on that? Or I guess the point would be just to get it out of your eyes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, um, yeah, no, uh, that, that's not bad advice. So, of course, uh, um, you know, there'd be great complications with contacts. And, you know, if you were to get tear gas under a contact lens, you know, you're not rinsing that out. It's it's actually protecting the, the contact lens is stuck to your, 
the IRA, so it's kind of protecting that. Um, so, so you would hope it would protect you, but it, it would actually probably do more damage. So, yeah, if you could pull those contacts out before you go to bed or, or wear glasses, you know, starting right now. Um, you know, glasses, too, it's another protectant from projectiles as well. You know, um, that's why, you know, you see mechanics in certain cases wearing safety goggles. You see, um, you know, military troops, they're, they're issued goggles when they go out to the desert to prevent them from sand getting in their eyes. It's just having glasses is a good protectant for your eyeballs all around anyways. You know, mm-hmm. Certainly wouldn't protect you from OC spray. Uh, maybe it would protect you from direct contact with OC spray going direct. But these are normally fumes that are coming mm-hmm. through, so like a smoke, you know, that's coming through or a vapor. Um, you know, and that's where the, the water and the milk would be a good, um, you know, household item that you have available to you that would prevent any irritation from that. And so another, uh, weird, you know, cause I'm, I'm the type of person that likes to run through all, <laughs> all possible, um, scenarios. So, sure. what if, um, y- you know, your home is on, on fire and, and you, um, uh, did make it to your car and, and you, and you took the advice that you suggested it's property, get out if you can. Um, mm-hmm. but what happens if you sustain injuries, um, or a burn or something like that? Um, do you have any suggestions for, um, quick, quick fixes or things that you can do, uh, if you're not able to get medical attention right away? If, if you're in a situation where, uh, an injury occurs and you got to keep it moving uh, to preserve your own life and, and to take care of your family. Do you have any suggestions sure. on, on how you navigate that? Yeah. So um, one, don't mess with it. <laughs> no, you don't want to touch it. Uh, covering is always a, uh, is a good thing. So if you, if you, if you have a t-shirt or if you have something like that, you want to cover the rooms immediately because you, you don't want bacteria to get infected you know, ultimately you want to get to an ER. So in route, um, if you're driving yourself to a hospital and it may take 20 or 30 minutes, yeah, then ultimately the immediate um, is to to cover it. Um, you want to prevent that from getting infected. Um, and ultimately you don't want anything. It's going to hurt. So you don't want things to touch it anyways. So, yeah, any way that you can cover any of the, the burn areas, um, it's important that you do so. Um you know, also, it, it, you know, I, I was just mentioning today that for the first time in human history, we have access to the world's knowledge, right? 24 <laughs> steps. You can be in the middle of Iowa at 2.30 in the morning. And if you want to know what the diet of a three-toed sloth is, you can get it, right? <laughs> and so use the tools that you have available to you, right? Um, you know, make sure that, like, like if, if you're going through this, if you have time, you're like, oh, man. I'm in the car, I'm getting away from this burning house, and this person is in pain, let me Google what I do, right? Um, because that, that is some immediate, immediate reply to you. I mean, you know, even if it's simple as GPSing to the nearest hospital, you know, or mm-hmm. for urgent care center, you know, mm-hmm. um, the idea of, uh, is, is out of any of this is, is what do you have available to you? You know, what resources do you have available to you? And resources just don't have to be things in your house. It could be people, too. You know, that that nurse that you know down the block, is she off work? And knock on her door, you know, uh, things like that. You know, so um, you'd be surprised how, how communities actually do come in, together in, in times like this. I, you know, I, I know it seems like Armageddon out there in certain places, but um, understand the community is still strong. and and there are a lot of people that want to help. So use them, you know, they, they want to do that, you know? So if you know people that, that know things, then yeah, you know, um, reach out to them, you know, especially in, in times of need, you know, do you have any thoughts about, uh, COVID-19 being sort of an additional concern right now, um, in how we navigate this, obviously your experience, um, in combat and, uh, you've seen a lot and and understood that there are sort of the uh, threats that you face immediately um, in a combat situation, but that there are environmental factors that play in other things that you're also navigating simultaneously. So sure. do you have any best practices for how we stay safe 
in our homes and sure. in evacuating or doing what we need to do, and there's a pandemic going on. Sure. So, um, again, going back to the Google statement and the information, utilize CDC's advice. Right. It's got to be. Man, I, I can't I can't imagine what people are going through right now in the middle of a riot and a pandemic at the same time. Um, political side view set aside. I think we all I think 10 out of 10 people agree that the year 2020 sucks really bad right now. So. Um, <laughs> so but but yeah, dealing with the pandemic in, in the middle of it. So when we deploy uh, to forward operating bases, a lot of times we get this thing we call deployment crud. And what deployment crud is, is when you get into a foreign country, that your antibodies or your bo- your, your your homeostasis process isn't uh, up to par with what's going on in third world countries, you get really sick. And a lot of it's respiratory. So you have this cough for about two or three weeks, and they give you these amazing pills um, that kind of somehow wipes it all out in 24 hours. I wish I knew what that miracle drug was, but um, you just kind of take it, and you have to work through all these things, Right. Um, you know, so some people will go to work with 102 degree fever, you know, because you have to defend that base. But um, psychologically, it kind of plays its toll on you too. So, one of my advices of when it comes to pandemic is prioritize. Right, you have to prioritize your health. I understand that there's riots going on, you know, but you can't let that. You can't let the fact that this pandemic's going on and set that aside. It's very serious. It's claiming a lot of lives. Um, people with respiratory issues, it's really rough. And then now they got to worry about OC spray or or possible uh, fume inhalation from fires. You know, um, wear that mask, continue to keep social distancing, just like the CDC offers. And um, ultimately, non-politically and non-scientifically, non-medically, do what you feel is going to make you safe. Do what makes you happy. All right. I, I see a lot of back and forth on Oh, you didn't wear the mask when you're out, or you did wear the mask when you're out, and and there's politicizing. You have to sit down and have a conversation with yourself and realize what it is that's going to actually make you feel happy and how you can get back to some normalcy. And if that means that you are afraid of a pandemic, you should be, right? And if you want to wear a mask, then continue to wear a mask, you know? Um, uh, If you need to see a doctor, you know, go to the doctor, you know, um, I know that there's this fear, but, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 is a very serious thing, you know, and, and I don't make light of it. Now, I have my political standpoint, my political views of what COVID-19 is, but that doesn't override any of the medical or um, psychosocial aspects of what COVID-19 is doing. So um, mm-hmm. you have to prioritize to yourself, you know, where that fear lies or, or where your rationale is. It doesn't always have to be fear. You know, you have to rationalize what your health is and, and you know, what's more important to you. Do I, do I, am I more worried about, you know, the riots that are happening or am I really more worried about my respiratory issues that I may have and, and the, the effects of COVID-19? So um, if there's any, especially in Twin Cities, if there's, if if there isn't any more emphasis on staying at home, I don't know what could convince a person to stay home more right now. You're also a, a social scientist and um, mm-hmm. really have a passion uh, uh, centered around mindfulness and yeah. having an, uh, having that connection, as you mentioned, to what makes you happy. Um, thinking about yeah. the psychosocial side of this and yeah. do you have any strategies for how you manage your own anxiety, uh, how do you fall asleep when every news station is showing you burning buildings? Right. So here's the thing. So anxiety and depression uh, claim almost 5 million people a year. So almost 5 million people a year are diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Of that, 1 in 14 commit suicide because of those. And that's a very, very sad and tragic number, right? And there are tools that you can use for anxiety so and, and depression. So they're what we call in the social science words, they're, they're cognitive thought processes, right? So there's, it's just your mind telling you irrational thoughts. You know, uh, anxiety is that the worry, you're, you're worrying of an unforeseen future and depression is you're, you're really worried about the past. 
and a simplified version. It gets a little bit more complex than that, but that's kind of simplified. So mindfulness techniques. Um, one of the biggest things that you have to do when it comes to anxiety, and, and, and I can imagine people have a ton of anxiety, and after all this, this destruction and death, um, that they have a huge amount of, of depression. The first thing you have to do is, is challenge. You have to have a conversation with yourself. You have to challenge yourself on what you believe, right? How much, so if you feel guilty, how much do you truly, what percentage of that guilt do you really feel? I feel really sad that this thing happened. Well, place a percentage value to that, right? Like how much is the, of this is my fault, right? Um, because a lot of people will put guilt and burden on themselves that aren't really involved. It doesn't mean that you can't have compassion. It doesn't mean you can't feel bad or sad, but it's, but when we're talking about anxiety, um, one of those things is to just really, really, um, you know, weigh the evidence out. Think of yourself as being on trial or you're a lawyer, right? Here's the thought that comes in my head. The world is at an end, right? Uh, that's what some people probably feel right now. So the first question is, well, what evidence do I have to prove that the world is coming to an end? And you'll find that maybe you don't have as much evidence. And then you say, okay, what evidence supports that claim? And am I looking at all the evidence collectively? And another technique that we do is say, we, we always ask, well, what if your friend came up and told you that? What would you tell your friend, right, or a family member? And you need to kind of tell that to yourself too, right? And that's one way to challenge the negative thoughts of anxiety. One of the exercises that you could do to help with anxiety is meditation techniques or sleeping techniques, right? And you can look these up on like YouTube uh, or, or I think maybe Pandora or, or one of the other um, media uh, outlets that, that um, has a lot of podcasts and things like that. There's mindfulness podcasts out there to help you get to sleep. And meditation is a, is a huge key because what happens in anxiety is that you have a thousand things going on in your head at one time and you really can't isolate one thought. And you drive yourself crazy trying to figure it all out. What you need to do is step back and take a few few breaths, kind of center yourself and recalibrate yourself. All right. So just like a car, when a car is sputtering and having uh, some difficulties, you need to kind of re get, it, get it recalibrated. And that's taking time to kind of breathe and release a lot of tension. So if you kind of if, if those who are listening, kind of if you Google. Um, mindfulness and um, exercises, you should get something that comes up on YouTube or something like that. And what it is, is it just puts you in a meditative state. You can do it for three minutes or you can do it up to 45 minutes. Um, and it will really, really kind of centralize you and it will really help you to and assist you to fall asleep. And it's really just kind of redirecting your mind to challenge these negative thoughts that are coming in. Because in reality, we create a lot of this negativity and we have the ability to to kind of squash it, you know, so. But while we're worried about that fear of what's happening in the neighborhoods and how it may impact us physically, we have to take time for our mind. You know, we, we, you really do. You know, when, when the nation has been called to isolate itself for the past three months because of a pandemic, it's very hard to believe that that doesn't affect people mentally. Mm -hmm. And ideally, your mentality, and it's, it's, been, it's been proven time and time again, your mental health affects your physical health constantly, right? Your heart rate rises when you have high anticipation, right? Your, your blood pressure uh, gets out of whack, which affects your organs and things like that. So there's some very physiological things that happen. There's also some biological things that happen, you know, uh, very scientific things that happen. And it's just as simple as taking a moment out of your day and maybe breathing for a little bit, 30 seconds here and there or something like that, you know, so... Uh, you've listed a number of resources that I've found very helpful right now to focus on gratitude, to, to focus on, on what's going right, what I can do. Um, sort of, I am, I am the pick up the paper towel person and, and put it in the trash <laughs> good. can. Very good. I, I try to be, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a team. little more germaphobic <laughs> during COVID. So if I didn't have a good <laughs> pair of gloves on and access to something to wash my hands after picking up that towel, right. you know, I, I've had to make those um, very difficult uh, <laughs> decisions. Yes. But I, I'm, most, I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, I tend to be a pretty sunny disposition person. Um, I, I am very passionate about 
trying to help people and, and sort of bring light into the world and all of that. But the truth is there are some people who do have uh, real barriers with their mental health um, and sometimes just thinking it positively is kind of difficult. And I do have to express that this is a time when, when that group of folks are more vulnerable, as you mentioned. But uh, in a climate that we're in, uh, do you have any suggestions? Because you've seen a lot. Um, mm -hmm. What if someone in your family is in crisis? Same. Uh, I was mentioning some of those tools. Those tools for you as an individual also work for your family. Obviously, you know, try. It, it's it, it's very difficult. So even with my own family, I I practice social work, and it, and I won't be my family's therapist. I tried once. I got yelled at. That's never going to happen again, right? So even with my family, if I, if I'm dealing with my family that has depressive issues, we do have depression. We have anxiety that's heavy in this household. We go and seek professionals, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's expensive. Right. Not everybody's insurance covers mental health, uh, uh, you know, coverage and it can be expensive. But, you know, uh, yeah, I, see, there, here's where I have a problem with work. Right. So if you break your arm, you'll go to an ER and you'll get a cast. And then people don't have a problem with paying one hundred and fifty dollars. So you get a cast put on their arm. Right. Um, but what happens when you break your brain? I mean, there's really no cast for that. Right. Other than therapy and maybe some medication. But. Medications only treat a symptom. They don't cure an issue. So medication without therapy, um, it's, kind of, it's, it's just medication. And, you know, even if you broke your arm and your cast is, you know, repairs that bone, it'll repair much faster. You'll be able to have more function out of your arm if you include physical therapy with that. I don't know why our society refuses to see that our brain, which controls every process that we have, to include repairing bones when you break them, why we don't keep them in check. So prioritizing that, I would rather spend $150 on a session. I'd rather spend $100 on a, on a session for mental health than lose a loved one. Because the reality is, is, is depression, um, you know, takes lives. It absolutely does. I'm, I'm staggering, you know, in staggering amounts on an annual basis. So my suggestion is, just like I said at the beginning of this, you know, the rioting, get out of your house. Run, leave, be safe. If you see depression within your family, get them help. You know, you have to take them to see somebody. But fortunately, there are crisis centers in most city, cities that you can contact when you're feeling bad. And they have placements. They can get you the help you need, you know, for an affordable price, if not free. You know, there are certain programs that can do that, right? So sometimes people get mad at other people. And to them, they want to punch that other person. They want to be violent with that other person. But they take a step back and they punch a wall instead. And to most people, that seems rational, right? Better to punch a wall than a person. But what we forget is the overall rational situation is to not punch anything at all, right? And so when we're talking about rational, it's completely subjective. So your right and my right and your wrong and my wrong are two totally different things even though we might end up in the same spot. And so what's going on right now, when we're, when we're talking about rioting, and we're talking about protesting, we're talking about anger, right? You have to listen to the people because that's their rationalization. And hopefully you can be the person that kind of convinces them not to punch anything at all. But if they have to punch something, you would hopefully redirect them to the wall than another person. But it starts with understanding. And validating. And I want to say to everybody else that's listening to this, and this is very important, out of everything that I said tonight, I think this is the most important thing. You are valid. You are important. I believe in you. I believe your words. I hear you. You are absolutely important. You are not less than. You are somebody. And I love you and I appreciate you. I hope everybody understands that. If you got nobody, you got me. Thank you, Jared. I wish you could just come to Minneapolis and save call <laughs> right now. Uh, but I thank you for uh, joining me um, in this way and sending so much love and so much support. I think it's deeply felt. Um, thank you for your expertise. Once again, thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. 
And th- again, thank you for giving me this opportunity and having enough confidence in me to help anybody out. And for our audience, thank you for stepping outside of the paradigm that we started with light and shadow. Uh, we are telling important sports stories. So grateful to have um, a great American hero on the line with us today. And we'll continue to bring you more great, exciting uh, sports stories. But this was just too important for us not to attempt to do something uh, with this very exciting and growing uh, platform. So thank you to everyone who has uh, followed, subscribed, liked, and and shared Light and Shadow. Uh, We're going to do more of this as long as you keep giving us great feedback. So we're so grateful that you joined us, and we'll see you next time.